Satam, yogis and yoginis. Hello and welcome one more time. Welcome to the one of the last parts on the mantra course. We are almost finishing the, um, the, the biggest aspects of the theory on the mind and consciousness and ego and the relationship between all these factors. And um, I'm very happy to reach at this spot. Uh, at this point, uh, I hope that uh, if you came here and you have been seeing all the other parts, then uh, congratulations for reaching this far. Satan Sohel, hello, welcome to the stream, hello. And today we're going to put all these different pieces together and we're going to figure out how does this project us towards the final objective. And when we talk about the final objective, I'm going to clarify that all these different terms from uh, yogic traditions and Indian or, or even Buddhist traditions like, like Nirvana, but we have, oh, Sadam, Les, Sadam, hello, welcome. So we have all these terms like um, enlightenment and liberation and Samadhi and, and uh, Nirvana and Moksha and uh, Jiva Mukta and Shunya and uh, Turiya. I don't know, am I, am I forgetting some? There is all these terms, self, self-realization, <laughs> self-knowledge. We tend to utilize these terms in such a way that is quite loose, like um, they are all kind of synonyms, aren't they? Well, not really, not really. And um, having gone through this whole process, understanding what the mind is, the mind is a good frame of reference to studying consciousness, actually. And, and I mean, the... It's all about consciousness, isn't it? There is one, there's one of these sayings like, what's the point of life? Well, the point of life is to become a point of light. And this point of light, is a, it's the point of light of consciousness, right? So realizing that we are conscious, consciousness and doing that consciously. So if this is the, the final objective, then uh, the thing that traps our consciousness, our mind may, mainly, is um, one of the most important factors to have to, to relate to, to understand what's happening in relationship to us reaching to that final goal, if it makes sense. Sadan John, hello, welcome. Welcome, welcome everyone. So yeah, today is, is quite special because we're gonna put all these ingredients together. And, um, and as I said, I mean, all these parts of the course have been mostly theoretical slash philosophical in the sense that I haven't been guiding many meditations nor many practices on the mind. I was thinking whether I was going to include them during the course or I was going to do them like in addition to the course. I generally do some of the practices during the other days that are like um, in the middle between one day on the course and another that we do the live stream. So if anybody wants to go to the live stream, you will, you're going to find a lot of practices there. But I'm also thinking that um, right after the, uh, the mind course, I'm going to go with the numbers. We're going to start with numbers and uh, we're going to start with the mind again. But uh, from the numbers perspective, we're going to bring the numbers and try to understand the mind with the numbers. And that's going to help a lot. Today, I'm going to bring a little bit of that uh, because of the diagrams that we have been drawing. But um, the, hopefully for the next course, then we're going to be joining this together with that and also doing some exercises for the mind. But if anybody wants, like, if you have some particular interest on in what to do with the mind, then we could talk about it here in the mind course um, and maybe in some farther um, parts to this course. So we could, you know, I could uh, leave the course open, let's say, let's not, con let's not assume it's finished, and then in the future maybe add some more practical um, parts in which is more hands-on, how to deal with the mind, how to deal with a negative thought, how to deal with when the mind is doing its games, when, how to deal with um, what are the mind games and things like that. And that could be like a whole course in itself. Could, we could do like seven or eight or ten more parts just on these things. Um, but I'm not sure how much interest is on that right now. So I'm, I'm, I've been right now exploring the philosophy, so I don't know how much are you interested in that. If you are interested in that, let me know. But uh, today we have a very clear objective, very clear goal. And so let's start moving towards that. And I'm going to be showing like 
the different um, ingredients, the different pieces of the puzzle that we have been seeing throughout this mind course, and hopefully we're going to put them together in some coherent way. That will require me being coherent. Let's hope that I am today. <laughs> but um, there is there is one before I put the diagrams from the mind course. There's one diagram which I did it in another video, which is not included in this mind course, and I'm thinking it should be included. And that's the the video on the self. I've already shown it a few times. I'm going to show it again. Let's just calibrate the camera. Where do we go? Here. This diagram on the self, the different aspects of the self, the higher self um, linked to the, the spirit, the consciousness, the, the, the highest, um, the purusha in the, in the highest sense, in the most subtle sense. And then the individualization of the spirit becoming soul and coming in within us. This is the false self, the ego. And then as we come deep, this is the real self, the satnam, and then this is the hidden self, our um, subconscious patterns which trap us and create all sorts of troubles and problems within us. I don't want to go into this because I went through this in the video on the self, but uh, this was a very relevant one because we were introducing the idea that there's this self and there's a higher self and they are connected in a particular way and finding this self is what we would call self-knowledge, uh, or realize the self, who, who we are, who we are, who we really are. This essence of Sat Chitananda, yeah? Concretizing it within the, this aspect of the self. So that diagram was very necessary, and maybe I will bring it every now and then. I will try to combine it with the things. Um, but, um, but that was not, I did include it as part of the course. Now, when we were starting this course, I, I said we would combine the Western understanding and the Eastern understanding, and uh, we did go through um, the Western evolution of the brain, understanding of the evolution of the brain, which gives us a really good input on how the brain actually works. Uh, let's remember that when we are afraid, and or, yeah, for example, when we are afraid or very stressed, then the core of the self, the inner aspect, the more reptile aspects of the brain is the one that is more active. And these higher functions of the brain are disabled, which does not allow us to have conscious, like high decisions, make, make good choices, let's say. So um, knowing our response to fear is very important to know how, how much command do we have over the way that the brain is going to be operating. So if we are in, in afraid, if we are stressed, we are triggering this response from the lower brain or even from the emotional brain, the limbic system, then we are not allowing like the higher functions to properly operate. And it's the higher function, functions which are going to help us to be stable and still and strong and steady and gather our wits and, and focus our energy and command the brain towards whatever we want to do. Uh, rather, we're going to be reacting and creating more karma in the reactions and messing up and all sorts of issues which are going to be um, pre like um, not in our advantage, yeah, against us. Now, if we can go towards the surface of the brain, that was that was this was the core. As we go to the was this, the cortex and the neocortex. Uh, we have this expression between the two sides. I call this a butterfly brain, the left and the right. And we explored also what would be the dharmic expression of one hemisphere or the other, what would be the karmic expression of the two. And how the objective in yoga would not be to be in one or another, but actually in the balance between the two. I have a, I have a set of videos on the Kundalini. Uh, explaining how in order to awaken the Kundalini, we need to balance both uh, energies in the body, Ida and Pingala, talking about the main nadis in the body, but uh, they are also reflected in the two hemispheres of the brain. So it would come to say that the, the final objective is not to stimulate just the right brain, which is the one that is less active in our Western mind, let's say, but it's actually balancing both. So it's finding a balance between the two and putting it to our service. So being able to utilize the mind for our own um, benefit, let's say, to put it in our service. So that was the 
understanding how the brain structures operate, how we can utilize that understanding from the perspective of yoga with alternate nostril breathing to balance them or some particular exercise that we would do to activate one or activate the other. These were all things that we were exploring to, to see how we could relate to the brain in way uh, from the perspective of yoga. So what could yoga bring to our relationship with our brain? Having said that, we explored how the brain operates mostly in a, in a programmed way. We have been programmed by our family, our society, our genes that we inherit from our parents and and um, whatever we have received in the formative years have been also forming our pattern of thought and they crea it creates uh, habits, habits and games, mind games. Now these habits, this way of thinking that is mostly reactive to the outside, this is going to trap us and we're going to be, uh, first we create the habits, then the habits are trapping us. And now that they are, we are trapped, we have no capacity to open our consciousness into like seeing the things as they are because we are used to seeing them through these filters of these um, formed ideas or preconceptions or prejudices that we have been establishing at the early age. So this is to say mind traps consciousness and therefore when the mind, and mind being mind, ego mind, like the complex, but the, the union, the complex union between the ego and the mind, trapping the consciousness and not letting it flourish. So we were exploring how we should separate both ego mind and consciousness, and then even ego and mind we should separate, which is something that we could accomplish as we explore the different aspects of the brain, what we did in the last video on manas, chitta, buddhi, and ahankar, ahankar being the part that is more commonly connected to the ego. But in general, consciousness being trapped by the mind means that when we are looking at a, a diagram on how consciousness operates, let me bring some more light. This is a, a Western understanding of consciousness, but it's also an Eastern one. This is a nice way to connect both. Uh, here, when we go into numerology, we will see how the numbers are present through the different elements. Unconscious would be linked to number one, and then subconscious will link, link to two, and then semi-conscious to three, and four, and five. However, when we are trapped by the patterns of the mind, that's when we are operating mostly in the semi-conscious, being influenced by whatever it is in the subconscious. So whatever is here, and I put a number of examples of kind of garbage that we throw inside, and that's going to feed these little things that are floating around, which can become monsters, but they are like insecurities, guilt, shame, fear, all these kind of things. Now, these things are going to be producing subconscious thoughts and those subconscious thoughts come to the surface and we operate from them and that's karma. When we are operating from that place, then that's when we are reactive and therefore we are creating karma. And any karma that we create outside, that gets a reflection inside and uh, we, we are planting new seeds for future karmas and these seeds are stored here in the depth of the subconscious I put here some scatters we could call this area the Akashic Records as well. If you heard the term, then it would refer to this. The Akashic Records are recording everything that we do, and everything that we do has a consequence, so that would be linked to the, the samskaras. Yeah? And if we go very, very deep, some traumatic situation, something that could be um, traumatizing for a child, and a child, particularly a children, because, I mean, it can happen as an adult as well, but I'm thinking about children because children don't have the maturity to deal with a situation which could be very intense emotionally, uh, physically, mentally. And then if, if, if that happens, then the child stores the memory and keeps it very, very deep in the subconscious, touching the unconscious, in, the, in like an... Uh, abyss, yeah, like a crevasse, deep, deep down. And then those are little monsters and these are not to be faced by yourself. You need somebody to help you, some therapy, if you have to deal with them. Sometimes we can just leave them there 
and forget about them and hopefully if you know we if, for hopefully if, that's, if it's if it's not um sabotaging our life too much right now we can just put a little lid here put a little lock close it down and leave it there and don't look at it again and maybe you know by the time we maybe reincarnate in another life if we have to reincarnate hopefully this stays here and it doesn't have to come back and mantra can have an effect to to work like this John says, I found that juggling three balls helped bring my left and right brain in synchrony. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Yeah, because anything that is going to use right and left hand is going to be operating both hemispheres of the brain. So in yoga, we do a number of exercises and always finding, you know, this. Uh, not always. We are not always doing symmetric exercises, but very often we do an exercise with one arm and then the other or one side of the body and then the other. And the idea is this to connect both hemispheres. So that's a very, very dynamic and immediate, right? Juggling three balls. That's quite interesting. It just I just remember the um, this book by Paulo Coelho. No, he he's talking about the um, what was it, what was the name of the book? Um he's he becomes a doctor. I can't remember the name now, but he he starts learning juggling and he, he said, he, I think he said that the three balls was difficult, but the, I think when the fourth was introduced, it, it became really, really hard. Or the fifth, I'm not sure if it was the fourth or the fifth, but that's when it was really, really, really hard. Have you had an experience, John, trying to add a fourth ball or a fifth ball? And um, if adding one more is like just struggling a little bit more, or if it's like an exponential uh, challenge to have four things at the same time. I'm thinking about the number. Yeah, I'm thinking about numbers and I translate to numbers. So it could be interesting to know if it's just um, a three balls or when there is a fourth or the fifth, something special happens and it becomes even harder than that. But yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good, that's a good tip. So, okay. That was the diagram on consciousness, the different aspects of consciousness. And we said that the word for consciousness in Hindi, in Sanskrit is chit, and that would refer to chitta. But uh, there is different ways of looking at the mind. The way Yogi Bhajan would put it is like there is some three aspects of personal mind, the negative mind, the positive mind, and the neutral mind. And then there's the four impersonals, manna chitta buddhyahankar, which he would call the universal mind relating it to chitta. But uh, these three of negative, positive, and neutral, those are the ones who would be operating in this area, in the subconscious, in the semi-conscious, and in the consciousness. So when we are saying that we should not be negative, but we should not be just positive, we should find the neutrality is about listening to what the negative and the positive mind have to say and finding the balance between the two, or uh, from the neutral mind, choosing which of the two give the, the one that is like the wisest choice to take. So a neutral man would be linked to consciousness and therefore it would be linked to, in some way, uh, like a conscious choice. So choosing which of the voices from these two minds am I going to listen to. And um, all right, that was, that was interesting. That was a good way to connect some of the aspects of the Western with some of the aspects of the Eastern. Now we... As we um, moved on in the, in, the, in the course, I introduced the concept of the cosmic manifestation. And um, this, is when, this is when it becomes even a, a little bit more complex, but uh, to me, much more um, rich. Because now we can see how this description of one, two, three, four, five going down, yeah, from the, from the one undivided, unmanifested, universal divinity, God, G-O-D, then that happens, separates as a polarity, which often we experience as a duality, and then there's the gunas, and then comes to the four minds, and then there's the five tattvas. So we're going we're gonna to do a new diagram today, and we're gonna, I'm going to put the, all this together with some of the concepts that we have been seeing here. And with the diagram that we saw the other day here. And actually, if we wanted, maybe we could even we could even connect it to this one. 
the life cycle of a thought. Hopefully, I mean, if you are here right now, hopefully you were you went through the other parts of the course because otherwise you may feel a little bit lost if I just mention a diagram and you haven't been here. But uh, hopefully you have been through them. Uh, otherwise, uh, I suggest that maybe you would like to later refresh your memory going back to the others. But this is the idea today. We're going to put all these pieces together and, well, if they are going together, they are going to go into one, one unified diagram, let's say. We're going to try to make the impossible today. Like, um, you know, uni unifying different uh, fields, different theories is like, uh, um, I, I guess it's like, you know, like they are doing in physics, they've been struggling to unify the theories of electromagnetism and, um, and quantum uh, uh, effect and um, gravitational forces and uh, there's putting all these different theories together in one framework with a set of equations that's really really hard so uh, we're gonna try to do something similar utilizing the um, uh, like one diagram to try to unify it all but I may just fail miserably so we will try we'll see but uh, hopefully we can find some some new understanding, some way, something that is going to actually simplify our understanding of everything. When, if we can see how everything is connected, it may clarify and simplify so that we don't have to remember all these terms and understand all the concepts, but just have an intuitive understanding of what's happening within. So, should we go for that? Should we go ahead? Should we risk it? <laughs> I feel myself a little bit accelerated today. It's my Spanish blood, probably. Why you do? Let's slow down. I wanted to do a summary very quickly before we were diving into, but um, it's been 26 minutes already, so I, I, I failed with it very quickly. But uh, hopefully we will be successful in putting that pieces together. So let's go for that. So, as usual, we're going to draw a little, a little yogi here. And, um, okay, yeah, how am I going to do this? Our usual diagram. Let's get all the colors. All right. So, if, if you remember, when we were looking at this, the cosmic manifestation, there's a number of ways that we can see this. But I'm going to use a different different method today. Look, we have the chakras. That's one. There's two. There's three. Wait, I was going to go with blue. Nope. Green. Green, then blue. I'm going to use this light blue. And I'm going to use a purple. But I want to notice something as well. I'm going to use numbers today. Because there's not going to be anything more useful to join all these things together than using the numbers. So this is chakra one, two, three, four. Five, this is six, this is seven. And um, look, the number eight is on top of us, like this. Like the symbol of infinite. And the number nine is above us, like this. So, let's see. When in the video for 2024, 
to introduce the energy of this year, I mentioned how the numbers are connected. So one is connected to nine because one plus nine make 10 and two is connected to eight. So one, two plus eight make 10 and so on. So one and nine are connected. That means that when we come to this diagram, this cosmic manifestation that we could see here going down, you can also see one is connected to nine, two is connected to eight, three is connected to seven. So you can see how you see the similarity? Yeah. So this is our, this is us, and, and our experience goes from the one to the seven chakras, I'm talking now. And every chakra is a, like a little switch of consciousness. Like the higher you go, the higher your consciousness is, and you operate from a different level. But even after reaching the level seven, there is just two more th things. It's just that our consciousness, when we reach the seven, the perception is the infinity, eight, yeah? And this infinity could, could also feel like an infinite gap between me and God. So you see, if this is the number nine, in the opposite direction, let me use the pink because I'm not using it for anything else. So the opposite is one plus nine at 10, so this, this is the one. So this is, as you can see, the one unmanifested divinity, yeah? There is one God, Ekon Kar. So this one God, whatever we call it, we call it Allah or, or God or Dios or whatever word we choose to, to call it, this one divinity then is expressed through the world. In order to express itself, it has to separate the, the Purusha and the Prakriti, the Shiva and the Shakti. This is when, when we were coming down into the second level, you remember? From Purusha to Prakriti, from the, the purity of the spirit to the creation and the creativity. So this is coming into the two, you see? One and one, so this is two. And as we come here into the seven, then we are coming into the three. And then we come four, five, how interesting, five is the same. And then we go six, seven, eight, and nine. Now, why am I putting these numbers? Why is that necessary? Why is it even useful? Because if we can understand that this diagram, this diagram is happening, is happening right here right in us, in our experience of the world. So, um, how can I do this? So, one, two, three, four. As, I'm, as I, we are coming into the four, the four was the four minds. So, let's put the four minds here. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this diagram and we're going to do this right here. It's just that I'm not going to draw everything with every name and explaining how everything is, but I'm going to just going to draw these four circles. Meaning that we have these four different functions of the mind. Yeah, this will be manas, this will be chitta, this will be Ahankar, and this will be Buddhi. Yeah, this is a good way. I'll just put the initial name, the initial word, and you get it. And here I'm going to do something similar. This is the, the Shiva and the Shakti. Yeah? So uh, remember, Manas was the, th the, the part of the mind which interacts with the outside world. And it does so through the Indriyas. Well, you see, if this manifestation, this cosmic manifestation, this is happening within us, so that as we come from the four, we come to the five. By the way, this five is the meeting point. It's interesting that this is the word. This is where we, are, where we speak. This is where we chant. This is where we chant the mantras. Yeah. And then the experience of everything that is going down from the five, five, five to the one in terms of chakras, this is related to the five elements. So these are the five tattvas. 
Well, let's let's do it down, up down here. But there is one, there is this thing that we say sometimes, as above, so below. This is, this is going to be very, very present in, in today's topic, because whatever is happening within us is a reflection of what is happening outside of us. So exploring this diagram within is the same as seeing the diagram outside of us. And you can see this diagram like this, yeah, and how... As, as we are coming down from the gunas into the tattvas, the tattvas are the things that we can experience and then they are coming here into the world. So let's say this is, again, let me, let me just draw very basically the same diagram. This is the same diagram here. This, is, this would be the inside, this would be the outside. Let's just draw it like this from one to the two to the three aspects, we have the four, and as we come into the five, then this would be the five elements, or tattvas, yeah? So, there is from more subtle to less subtle to more um, physical, let's say, more material. And then as, as this is coming down, we are approaching the place where we can actually perceive it. And our perception of it, it's received through manas, then our mind is engaged with that, and something is happening as a reflection within our body. And there is, there is a connection between this and this. Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully it's clear. This is the outside world. This is the inside world. They are both manifested in the same way, but we are just relating to it in that particular way. If, if it's not clear, let me know. Yeah? If, if you have any question, please ask. Hopefully so far so good. Okay. All right. So, very important, yeah? As above, so below. And also, things are happening in many levels, in many ways. Body, emotions, mind, spirit, it's all connected. And um, everything being connected means that, sorry, this diagram of consciousness, this is going to be happening also here. And uh, it's happening here on the, on the body, and on the mind and on the spirit in some way. So when we are looking at this diagram and we think that this is happening in the body, I'm just going to relate it direct, directly with the colors to this area. So we can see that the, this would be the realm of the semi-conscious and um, the orange would be the subconscious. I lost my orange. Pen here. So this is the water. Yeah. Let me just put it like little bubbles. And then this is the unconscious. What does this mean? Why am I relating consciousness to the body? Well, there is a on a certain level it is right here. So for example, the garbage that we accumulate in the subconscious, we feel it in the belly, yeah, in the lower belly. We can feel when we have, when we are struggling with a particular emotion, emotion is energy in motion, it generally arises and flows and comes down from this area, the area below the diaphragm. So this is the area that is going to be more flowing with movement and emotion, hopefully flowing as well. We don't want it to get stuck either, yeah? And if an emotion gets stuck, then, then uh, that, that could be the, the sign of um, a wound that hasn't been healed or a trauma. So that's why in yoga we work with the physical body. And what we are doing in this area, as above, so below. So when we are working here, this is going to have an effect on here. We're going to see this 
over here as well again in a moment, yeah? But yes, so this is the unconscious, the first chakra, the lowest part of ourselves, the subconscious, the second, the third is semi-conscious. And that's why, you know, in martial arts, we're always moving from the third chakra. But it's also like third chakra is the place where we are going into action. So the, this is where we go into the world. And we generally operate in the world, in the outside world, in a semi-conscious way. Oh, I see we have a message. Sorry, I didn't see it before. Is the Shakti in the infinity symbol the same as Shakti in the Kundalini energy? Yes, yes, indeed, yes, yes. So, good, good question. So, sh as above, so below, that means that the, when we are going later in a, in a, in a while, when we, when we are going to explore the enlightenment, realization, and all that, we're going to talk about the awakening of the Kundalini. That, that Kundalini energy, it's going to be asleep here. And I'm drawing a little S because that's the symbol of a snake. Yeah. Imagine this is a snake, right? And it's a slip down there. And this is Shakti, Kundalini Shakti. And it has to rise and it has to go to the crown. When it reaches the crown through the 10th gate, then this is called the 10th gate here in the crown, then it can merge with Shiva coming down. So Shiva and Shakti merging. So that, that's going to be SS, Shiva Shakti, brings S, Samadhi. So Samadhi being the fruitful rising of the Kundalini and merging with um, Shiva. At least a certain level of Samadhi. There are different kinds of Samadhi, yeah? But yes, that would be the rising of that Kundalini. So um, yes, the levels of consciousness are reflected here. And uh, so... Unconscious, subconscious, semi-conscious. We operate in the world from the third chakra. So this is our movement in the world. Now comes the heart. And the heart are the winds, yeah? Little winds flowing. That's the consciousness, winds of consciousness. Sometimes we breathe. And as we breathe, we are feeling inspired to do things. This is our heart operating here. Yeah, A green heart I'm going to draw today. And... This is the heart of consciousness. This is the realm of consciousness. This was semi, subconscious, unconscious. This is conscious. So we reach the level of consciousness. And that's why we said, you know, choose with the heart, you know, reach the heart. And that's why breathing next to the heart is stimulating consciousness. So this is how kind of like the signs of yoga, the postural yoga, the asanas, are going to be working on the levels of consciousness on the body. So if we are going to be doing an asana and we are doing this kind of movement, yeah? Opening the arms, right? Or maybe we are with the arms up or any kind of asana that implies this kind of opening with the arms. We're going to be stimulating the heart with all the good things that the heart has, but also stimulating consciousness. So this is bringing the realm of consciousness. If, for example, we wanted to, let's say work on some subconscious aspect of us, some insecurity or some guilt or so, something that is down in the subconscious that we want to work on, then we, would, uh, we could go and do exercises on the belly. Maybe moving the belly like in Breath of Fire, doing deep belly breathing is going to activate those things which are asleep in the subconscious. Sandan said, I just want to jump on real quick and say hi at work today. Okay. Have a good work and uh, thanks for dropping by and saying hello. Yeah, I love you too, Sadnam. The cave comes uh, comes just in the moment. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, this is the this is the the area of the cave. Yeah. So, this is this is where we are right now. Okay. So this, you see, this um, is a an inner representation of what is happening also in the mind. And, I'm, and I, now I'm going to talk about the mind because of the way that in, in Western world we will talk about the subconscious mind or conscious mind or unconscious mind. Generally, we talk about it in that way as if the mind could be conscious. Not really, but consciousness can be trapped by the mind or can be focused on the mind. So consciousness is also linked to the mind, not only to the body. So the very same thing that is happening right here, it's also happening here. So let's 
bring the same idea and now you will recognize the colors, yellow being the semi-conscious, hopefully you recognize it is from this diagram. Looks very bluish today, doesn't it? Let's see if I can fix this a little bit. One second. Thinking that this is not so white today. Can I make it whiter? Oh, that looks much better, doesn't it? Hopefully. Still a little bit bluish, but hopefully better. So, yellow being the semi-conscious, that's right here. Because you may remember when we talked about the four aspects of the mind. You, do you see the yellow line here as well? We mentioned how most of the time we operate, um, we, we relate to the outside world from a semi-conscious way. So most of them is like we are subconsciously processing what's coming in and we put filters and, um, and out of what's coming from the subconscious, we're going to operate outside in the, in the world. So that would be the output, so semi-conscious way, mostly. But there is a possibility that we can cross it. You see, so the, the, the yellow line crosses, but there is an, a, a space above the yellow line, which could be actually conscious, yeah, the green. Yeah? So there is a possibility for these green winds to flow, blow, which means that that just means that we can relate to the outside world consciously. So some of the examples of exercises I was giving the other day, I was, I was saying how, you know, get up in the morning and blindfold your eyes and, um, and do everything until you leave for work blindfolded, right? If you are, I, I said I did the exercise when I used to shave, I don't shave anymore, uh, but I would shave blindfolded, I would cook my breakfast blindfolded, I would eat it blindfolded, I would, uh, you know, clean the dishes blindfolded, everything blindfolded. Why? Why? Because it would stimulate my consciousness to relate it to my sense of touch. So I was focusing on the sense of touch in a very, very conscious way. So I was stimulating this area, let's say the conscious. Now think about of this like semi-conscious. So I was stimulating the consciousness aspect in relationship to the outside world, to the indriyas. And um, so we can see this here, yeah? This would be the... The subconscious would be those little bubbles, just like we have them here. They would be here in our mind. This would be literally this diagram. So it would be as exactly here yeah, that this operating is on the level of the mind. This is what it was new. We didn't talk about this, how this diagram was operating in the body. But now we can see in the body and the mind. And um, yeah, so that's happening here. Even unconscious, right? Because you see the chitta, memory, some memories, some uh, yeah, some memories can be stored in the unconscious, and we may never be able to access them again. But they may still be there, and um, you know this is how in hypnosis it can be sometimes triggered and awakened again, but uh, mostly it lies in the unconscious. So. Levels of consciousness on the level of the mind. Levels of consciousness on the level of the body. Okay? We just introduced this diagram with both. So far, so good. If you have any question or comment, please do so. There was something else that we did when we talked about the Western brain. We talked about the triune brain theory with the reptilian, the primate, and the, sorry, the mammal and the primate. And I made a connection with the chakras as well, if you remember. So the lower chakra, the lower triangle, the heart and the higher triangle of chakras. So again, we would have, this would be the reptilian part, the survival mechanism, the part of the brain that is triggered that is more in the center, like the nucleus of the brain, that would trigger 
the fight or flight mechanism and feeding and reproduction. So this is the area connected to the consciousness associated to these first three chakras, which now that you can see it linked to consciousness, you see how that's mostly linked to the unconscious, subconscious, and a little bit of the semi-conscious. So this reptile operation, reptile brain operations, they are happening on this semi-conscious, subconscious, and conscious level. And as you go into the limbic system and emotional brain, then it can, it, can, it can have the possibility to trigger its higher level. So it's probably more going into consciousness. But remember, the limbic system is a lot about emotions. And if the emotions trigger an re emotional reaction, that's going to bring us back into the reptile brain. So if we are feeling afraid, afraid being fear being a basic emotion is going to trigger the fight or flight mechanism. So the limbic system would bring us down. And this is what happens if the heart is not open and trusting and with faith and love. If we feel doubt in our heart and we are feeling uh, insecure, the heart closes and then we are regressing, regressing to a lower form of thinking and behavior, coming down our attitude from these lower chakras. So it's all connected. Hopefully it's getting clear. Yeah. So, all right, that diagram is there. That diagram is there. Oh, there we go. How about this one? Life cycle of a thought, which by the way, the drawing in the Thumbnail for this video was much nicer than this drawing that I did here in the moment. I, I improvised this one, but then when I was designing the thumbnail, I thought it looked much better in the thumbnail. But anyway, uh, so you remember a thought triggers a, a feeling, becomes an emotion, and generally an emotional reaction. And out of that, we desire something. And then out of that desire, we act. And that act is often a karma, which goes back to the universal mind and repeats itself. So this is what's happening here, right? We go down like this, and we could draw it um, maybe a light green I haven't used. So we could bring this diagram here, and we can see how... Let me do a little... Put this very light green from the thought, comes down, comes down into a feeling, from the feeling, an emotion, emotional reaction, the reaction triggers a desire, and now we want to act on that desire, we go into the world, we do an action, and that action may be karmic or dharmic, and that's going to have an effect going back into the level of the mind again is this yeah i don't want to do the whole drawing to mess up with too many lines but it would be this this is this is the process that we we follow yeah whatever action we do that's going to seed plant some seeds of karma that's going to be um into the samskaras in the depth of the subconscious right is going to be going over here yeah, so this line, blue, 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 goes goes right over here. We could draw it. We could draw it like this. Choop. Okay. Now, when the time is ripe for us to have a karma, maybe you know, maybe you have to be slapped. <laughs> <laughs> for you know somebody said something nasty to you and then you got enraged and then you slapped the person right uh, I'm, i don't think that's a good idea that's terribly karmic yeah but okay let's say we did it we couldn't control our impulse now that slap is going to be stored in the subconscious and now when the seed is ripe when is the right moment maybe we're in a situation with a different person in another moment and the seed makes us say something to the other person or act in a particular way in a very subconscious manner because you remember this is the realm of the subconscious and then that's going to trigger the other person reacting to what we said and slapping us back. So that's how the circuit is completed. 
So Lei, you are saying, can you elaborate a little on how to keep things that arise from getting into the subconscious and creating more karma? How to keep things that arise, that arise from where? From getting into the subconscious and creating more karma. I understand that being in our true nature sure circuits the process that you're understanding as well. Yes, well, when we were talking about this diagram, we said how there is, there is a, a number of places where you can you can uh, avoid getting into this trap. One is down here, when we're going to go into the action, you can choose whether it's going to be an, a karmic action or a dharmic action. So you can, which I call the karmic reaction or dharmic response. Yeah, I made this differentiation. Now, it's really hard here. When you are already down in the desire, this is really difficult to change. It, it takes a, a huge amount of um, willpower. Yeah. It's probably much easier to to stop it right here. So when one thought comes into the mind, to ch uh, be able to say, I'm not going to allow this thought. I'm not going to let it um, go deeper into me and just cut it right there. So... Um, your eyes arise within our mind from the ego. Yeah. So yeah. So that's it. So let's say um, some subconscious thought is arising, and then as it comes to the surface of the man and you notice it, then you can stop it right there. This is what um, this this exercise called gatka gatka thought. Gatka is a is a, mar a kind of martial arts in India, which they use swords. Yeah, and yeah, weapons. So the idea is that when you detect a thought that is going to be karmic, that is arising from within your mind, from the ego, like you are saying, you just cut it right there. So you have to be first very aware of the thoughts that are circulating through the mind. So that also requires a, a good level of consciousness to begin with. Because if it starts going into feeling an emotion, that there's who is going to stop it there? Yeah, it's going to go through the whole process. So you have to be very aware, and also when you catch it, then have the sword ready, right, and then cut it. Yeah, like with mantras or with um, yeah, like a good mantra is a good way to wahiru. Yeah, cut the thought in the track in its tracks, and don't let it develop. So that's that's one way. But you're asking. Um, how to keep things that arise from getting into the subconscious and creating more karma? Well, you see, the, the things arise from the subconscious. And so th there's a few approaches here, right? Another approach would be you can just clean the subconscious, which is basically what we do when we meditate. The main, the main idea of meditation, the main objective of meditation, first of all, the first benefit of meditation is to clean the subconscious. So you are... Um, avoiding those things which are already stored there from arising to the to the sub, to the surface, right? And then how to avoid things into getting there into the subconscious in the first place? Then that requires a certain level of consciousness again, but with practice you can have it. And then when you're operating from a certain level of consciousness, so that would be above the yellow line here. As something is happening in Indriyas, as you see something happening in the outside world, rather than immediately reacting to that and storing it in the subconscious, be calm and process it in the moment. So that's, and there's another term for that, it's called instant recall. So you, you see what's happening and you, you, you are processing it in the moment and you are um, um, letting it go without without creating a reaction to that and storing it into the subconscious. So basically, we need to avoid accumulating garbage here, first of all. And the more we are conscious, the more we are going to be ready not to throw any garbage in. And then whatever garbage has been accumulated, then we can clean that out. So those, that's there's those two aspects. And even so, there's always going to be something coming up from here. And then if something goes to the surface, as you detect it, then the Gatka thought to cut it. So this would be the three, the three um, approaching the problem from the three angles. Thank you. Your description is what I was looking for. As forms arise in consciousness, we give them no attention and no touch and eliminate them immediately. Yes, that's, that's the ideal. Yeah. Um, 
that's the idea, yes? As something arises from the subconscious, you just zip, you just cut it like that. Good. This is what we do in meditation. When we are meditating, you close your eyes, which means going outside from the outside, going inside, out from the outside world. And then as you go in, the first thing you meet is your subconscious. So all these thoughts that are starting to come up, they are coming from your subconscious. So let's be very cr conscious and very present. That's why we generally keep a mantra going, keep a pranayam going to, to stay awake. Yeah, to stay, look, mantra, pranayam, this, this realm, to, to stay here, conscious, not down here, right? And as you are stimulating this area, stimulating consciousness, whatever is arising in the mind, okay, whoa, that's a nasty thought. I didn't know that was in me. And then you cut it. And then you're cleaning, 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 cleaning the subconscious. So that's the process. Yeah? Good. All right. So, so that's bringing this diagram here into this perspective. Hopefully, hopefully is is making more sense. I'm not making it more complicated, hopefully. Um, are we ready for one more layer? If there is any doubt, let me know. Otherwise, I will move to the next layer. The next layer is not in any diagram that we did until now, but I'm going to take it from the conversation we had the other day and, and it's going to be actually directly from the uh, Yoga Sutras. So now we come into yoga, right? And um, we are ready to meditate. Okay. So, how are we going to do that? Patanjali is giving us some steps. Yes, please? Yeah, why do? No problem. Patanjali is giving us some steps. It's, it's telling us meditation implies a certain... How can I say this? I was going to say morality, but it's not morality. The yamas and the niyamas are more about, a, like, a, like I was going to say again, code of conduct, but it's not either. He, he's more like telling us, look, if you don't observe these things, these 10 things, these 10 yamas and niyamas, like ahimsa, you're going to be creating more karma, right? If you don't practice ahimsa, which is to not harm, right? then your actions are going to create more karma, which are going to store more seeds in the samskaras, accumulate in the subconscious, which makes that when we are in the world operating, there's going to be more flow of thoughts from the subconscious, of which we are going to be less able to stop, and those are going to trigger more emotional reactions, which are going to create even more karma. And the, it, this, is, this is like um, a vicious cycle. And, and it is accelerating itself. Every time is more. And the more karma, the worse it is. And you can feel it. You can, you can imagine some people who... I was right. I was now thinking, imagine a, a person who commits a murder. And then they are thrown into jail. I believe that to go into jail, it's an opportunity to stop, right? It's stopping you. It, they are forcing you to stop. But this can be an opportunity to stop what was happening in your pattern of this vicious cycle that, was, that took you down the path that made you go and commit that murder. So whatever happened before, because we don't know the history of that person, right? But we can imagine that it must have been a lot of shadow um, and I don't want to say shadow like something negative because sh there's a lot in the shadow that is not negative, but there is a lot of things in the darkness, let's say. Yeah, let's, there is a, a lot of trauma and a lot of pain within for a person to even commit something like that. But we don't have to go that far. You know, if you are with... Let's say, you know, I'm thinking about in a school, right? Bullying, you know, bullying. When one kid is bullying another one, that kid, the bully, what is his subconscious like? You know, how travel can he be that he needs to bully another kid to feel well with himself? When, when we feel well, 
We don't need to do any of that. So um, if you approach a person and you're saying something and they respond in a very negative way, you are like, whoa, that's not about me. That's about them, right? So what's happening within them? What's triggering all that? And you can imagine you are just spending a few seconds, a few minutes of interaction with them, but they are 24 hours with themselves. So whatever is happening in the subconscious is like wars and wars and wars. And that's how you may end up like committing murder, for example, right? So the opportunity to go into a jail is an opportunity to stop. And that can force stopping the vicious cycle an opportunity for redemption. Can we stop our vicious cycle without needing to go into those extremes, right? This would be the healthy way. And this is, what, this is why we meditate. This is why we do yoga, to stop the vicious circle, the vicious cycle, and, and not keep accumulating garbage and garbage and garbage. Because by the, by the time we, we get to 80 years old, if we do, it's going to be so heavy on us that we're just going to be a, like a grumpy old man and woman, right? Can we change the direction of this cycle? Because actually, just like the, the, the cycle of karma is just like um, accumulating every time more and worse, if you stop it and you reverse the cycle, it, it also works in the other way. So, as you start to clean the subconscious, there is less negative thoughts floating to the surface, which means that your mind is more clean and clear to see the indriyas as what they are. Now, when you are not seeing lions everywhere, when you are not reacting from a survival mechanism all the time, you can just react in a more human way from a different place and from a different perspective and not see everything as wrong. And when you are, can see things beyond that right or wrong, something we were talking last Thursday, then you don't accumulate so much garbage because things are what they are. They are not always against you. Why do you feel like that, right? So the moment that you cut it, then suddenly you can be aware and see that things are just naturally like that. And if somebody is angry at you, I mean, first of all, they are angry. It's like if you are in the street and somebody starts shouting, I mean, that's how they are feeling. It's not how you are feeling. So don't take it on yourself. Don't make it personal, first of all. Then, okay, what are they telling me? Is there something for me? If there is, I'm going to take it and I'm going to work on it. But if it's not, it's them. So the, the moment that you have cleared your subconscious a little bit, then you are more fresh with a fresher look, more clear vision into what's happening outside so that I don't accumulate that much garbage in the subconscious so that I don't start this cycle as a reaction and creating more karma. So you stop from creating more karma, then there is less garbage, then we are more clean, then we see things better, then we are more conscious. So it's also the opposite of a vicious circle. It would be like a virtuous cycle. So it's also like reinforcing itself and getting better and better and better and better. So that's the good news, right? <laughs> we just have to change from one vicious circle to the virtuous cycle. And this is what the whole purpose of yoga. So when coming back now, all these little things that I mentioned, coming back to when Patanjali gives us the yamas and the niyamas, he's telling us, look, if you observe these 10 things, you are going to be creating less karma and your subconscious is going to be more clean and then you're going to be more ready for the next bit. Good. So that's good news. And then, okay, what's the next bit? Well, the next bit is going to, what's going to help trigger the change from this vicious circle to virtuous circle. So what is that? Asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, samadhi. These six steps. Now, what are these six steps? First, asana. We're going to work on the body because you know what? Guess, in the body, as above, so below. What's happening below, this is a reflection, body, emotions, mind, spirit. So we're working here, and we are working here, and we are triggering this. So 
start working here because this is a good way to work on the subconscious without going into the subconscious, like physically diving in, not physically, but mentally diving into your mind and dealing with these, these monsters and, and sharks that you can find here directly because that's really hard. However, if there is a reflection of this in the body, working out the cellular memory of these traumas in your body is going to work out also the uh, whatever we are attaching to those uh, patterns in the subconscious and they are going to be cleared out and cleaned. So working, um, starting to work through the body is going to help you already to be clearing up what's happening in the subconscious. So whatever pain is in the body is a signal that something is wrong Everything is a reflection, therefore something is wrong also on that level. Therefore, as we are becoming healthier through the asanas, that's helping to be more healthy here. But also, now we are, as we are healthier, now there is more energy flowing and we need energy for the intense work we need ahead of us. Because Pratyahara Dharana Dina Samadhi takes a lot of energy. It's not some, it may look like very simple, just sitting down and just closing our eyes. Actually, the amount of energy it requires to just concentrate and stable and steady and still and the mind doesn't go away and the thought comes but we can see it and let it pass, that takes a lot of, not just practice, but also energy. So we need to build up on that energy. First, the body has to be healthy for the energy to flow, but then we have to increase that energy, pranayama. So you see, it will make sense. Huh? Everything is making sense. Asana, pranayama. Good. Okay. So now we're doing exercises with the breath, even though pranayama doesn't necessarily mean breath exercises, but, you know, breathing helps to increase the prana. There's prana in the oxygen, so let's go with that. So now we are doing, after the physical exercise, or with the physical exercise, now we are doing pranayama, so we'll see, we're going up, yeah, asana, pranayama, Okay, now we have more energy, now we have more prana, we are more awake and aware. Now what are we going to do now? Because that awakeness and that awareness, that energy, is that, where is that going to go? Is it going to go out? Now, on last Thursday, we, we had a, a beautiful live stream, it's not part of this mind course, but we talked about poetry. And um, we read a few poems and we talked about the five evils and the five thieves who steal our energy and how our energy goes away through the five holes. The, well, there's actually nine holes, but well, the, the five senses, let's say. Mainly they go through the holes in the face, yeah, the senses. So, asana, body is more healthy. Now we have more energy. The energy is flowing, pranayama, more energy increased, and awareness. And now that the awareness is rising, the energy is rising, is the energy going to go away through the senses? Or am I going to do something else? And this is where the thing is, we generally get distracted and we generally get distracted with the outside. Either with our, well, we can get distracted by a fantasy in our mind and we go into the floating into the ethers or we can go out through the eyes and into the outside world, you know, with computers and screens and things outside. So, Patanjali, 2000 years ago, very clever, he knew we would be in front of these uh, devices. <laughs> and he said, okay, asana, pranayama, pratyahara. And then he said, well, okay, now, all this thing that wants to go outside, don't do that, rather bring it inwards. So now comes the path. Now, let's say... This prana who, which wants to escape from us, we need to bring it back inwards. Yeah. So this would be this direction, bringing the awareness back inside. This is Pratyahara. And we are synchronizing with our inner self, going back within, trying to retract within. Yeah, the image of this, the the, um, the turtle that goes back into back in, back into its shell. Yeah, retracting the limbs and the head. Yeah, the five 
the four legs and the head. Yeah, that's five. So like the five senses going inwards. So that's Pratyahara. He's telling us, look, Asana Pranayama, you build up all this energy. Now don't bring it out. Bring it in. Because if you're going to find yourself, you know, this is the quest for self-realization. Self-realization, you're, gonna find, you're not going to find yourself outside in the beautiful mantra, mantra that is sounding in your CD or in the beautiful movie that you're watching in the TV or whatever. You're going to find it within. Okay, then, first of all, go within, Pratyahara, and now let's start to look for that self. And we're going to look through it in three steps. And there's dharana, dhyana, samadhi. Hmm, very interesting. Now, the very words, uh, when we translate them, tells us a lot. Dharana, we call it concentration. Now, concentration, that's a word that des describes things which have a common center. Concentration. So, for example, now let me, let me see this, this thing here. Let me just do it here, not to mess up the drawing. This is the S of a Satnam, the S of the self, of the real self. And Pratyahara is telling us, go in. I'm writing very quickly, but hopefully you can you can just understand it. So the awareness is telling us, go in. But going where? We don't know where our self is. So we start looking for the self. And there is a process of drawing. So, you know, <coughs> excuse me. You know this word, concentric circles? Have you heard of this? Like this... And this circle, they are concentric because they have the same center. You see, so they are around the center. Now, how are we going around the center? Because as you close your eyes and you go within, you start to experience yourself. And then a thought comes and distracts you. And you no, 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 it's not that way. Come, come in, come in. And then you are going back towards yourself, going back towards yourself. Another thought comes. No, go in. Then you have a feeling. Oh, my arm is a little bit painful. Then you go away. Then no, 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 go back, go back, go back. And you're going back in. So it's like you're going away and then no, no, let's go back in. No, 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 you're going away and then you go back in. And you are moving around the same center. But slowly, slowly, you start to move inwards. Inwards. So you see concentration... As you are looking for the center through the concentration aspect, yeah, concentration is going to bring the energy, making the circles smaller. Then you want to find the, the middle point, the middle. The middle point is mid, mid, mid meditation. Yeah? So from Pratyahara, Dharana, concentration, Dhyana, meditation. So you are, you are trying to find, through this process, the point in the middle, mid meditation. So the process of meditation, you are from distracted, you bring the energy in, and that, that the energy, no, sorry, the awareness, and that takes a lot of energy, yeah? But we build it up with asana and pranayama. Now, bring the awareness in, bring the awareness in, bring the, a thought comes in, distracts you. No, 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 go back. Uh -huh. My leg is falling asleep. Distraction. No, no, go back. And then you're going back in, going back in, going back in, going back in towards the middle point. And sometimes the concentration is so strong that you find the middle point and then, then you go, you lose it again and then you get distracted and you again you come back, then you get distracted. That, that's, that's meditation for you. You're concentrating and... And you're practicing concentration when you are distracted. And then as you concentrate more intensely, then you have moments of meditation. M -m -m -m, moments of meditation. And then that means a moment when you are in the middle. The moment when you're in contact with the self. 
then that moment you can realize that in that center is not about your subconscious thoughts. In that center, you just exist. You are there and you are conscious and you are consciousness. So that's, that's a moment of contact with your real self, with yourself. Yeah, that's kind of self-knowledge. That's the beginning of self-knowledge. And then as you meditate and meditate and meditate, the more you meditate, the more intense it can become and the more you strengthen the feeling of this self. To the point that if you build it enough and you made it enough, you can later go in the city, go outside, go to the supermarket, go wherever you have to go and stay in the self. And you can be talking to people, but you are in the self. You can feel that you are in yourself. So that's coming to the center, the meditation. That's not the end of the journey, though. That's meditation, yeah? That's, um, that has to be sustained. And then, like, concentration has to be sustained to get meditation. Meditation has to be sustained to get to samadhi. Now, samadhi is the same, sam, sama. So that's when you are starting to merge into the, the um, finding a union with the divine. Now, that union with the divine, inwardly, it would happen like going very, very inward and in the heart, finding some union with the cosmos. But the expression in yourself, energetically, would be as you are concentrating and going deeply, then you are stimulating the kundalini, which is consciousness. Kundalini Shakti is a consciousness. And that starts to rise. John asks, is that the place to do self-inquiry? Who am I? Well, self-inquiry, who am I, is, um, I would say, is the same path, but a different method. So this, this path I've been describing is the path that Patanjali describes, and we call it as yoga, yeah? Self-inquiry, I would call that Gyan Yoga, which is a yoga of wisdom, is when you are, rather than going outside with this, you are doing the same, basically, rather... But but you are you can be with the eyes open or you can be with the eyes closed doesn't matter, and you are like asking yourself well, what is this thought coming from? You know you're having a thought and you are feeling attached to that thought, and you identify with that thought and you're like hmm but is that me? I feel identified to that but is that me? No that's not me. So who am I? Who is who is the source to that thought? Who is behind that thought? Who is behind all that so you start to go deeper within and in a way you are going deeper within towards the self this is like the the path that uh, Ramana Maharshi would teach and he said when you are going there is like you're going inwards towards the, the heart in a way so it's like going down into the heart like that so yes it's the same process and it's the same place to do um no, sorry, self-inquiry is what takes you to that place, okay? No, it's not the place to do self-inquiry. It's the, it's, the, it's the process to get to that place. Yeah, When you're asking who am I, it's just that it's more mental process. Yeah? You are mentally discarding things that come up to the surface. You know, no, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not this, I'm not that. You just have to remind yourself to slowly come down into your heart as you are doing that. So if you are working on your physical body before, or you're doing some pranayam, if you are doing some asanas, some kriyas, that energy down here, stimulating energy down here, is going to bring the awareness down into the heart. It's going to be easier. If you just stay in the head doing self-inquiry, you could get very fascinated into a fantasy. And the thing with the mind is like, the mind is so powerful, it can make you believe that you are in samadhi. And it may make you think that you are realized and you are not. When I'm not saying you are not. I'm saying sometimes it can happen, right? So we have to be careful. And that's why it's very important to have a spiritual teacher who can tell us that we are going into this fantasy world. I've, I've seen it many times in, in yoga classes, star meditation, and you see this, ooh, this girl who is like ooh, floating around in, in the ethers. I just know that they are in a in a <laughs> mental fantasy, right? And they have to come down. So um, self-inquiry is a wonderful process and I love it and I practice it, but you have to be careful not to go into a outside, more into the mind realm 
but going down inwards into the heart center. All right. So, um, so this is the path going towards Samadhi, isn't it? We are reaching this word, Samadhi, and now we're going to explore the other words as well. But first, that before that, Le asks, when the self is realized both in and out of meditation, does the practice of meditation become no longer useful? Yes and no. Let's say that, let's say it in a different way. Let's say, because the thing is, we use the word meditation in two different ways. Meditation is something that we use as a verb and as a noun. We call meditation the, the practices that we do to get to the state of meditation. So the practices of meditation are not necessary in that moment if, when you get there, but the, the meditation as a state is necessary to hold it. And the thing is, to hold the stability of that state is difficult by itself. Um, and that's why if you continue meditating, it's going to help you reinforce the stability of that state. Does it make sense? There is a story, I, I cannot remember in now the details, but I think there was this realized monk, I think it was a Buddhist monk, and um, they said, Master, so what, what has it changed before um, with your realization? And he said, well, before I got realized, I would do my sadhana, I would tend to the garden, I would do my sariva, and I would cook the vegetables, and I would chant my prayers. And after getting realized, well, I do my sadhana, and I tend the garden, and I cook the vegetables, I do my seva, I, I chant my mantras, right? So nothing changes in a way. Somehow, if you get there, in a way, you, you wouldn't need to practice the things that help you get there. Um, but at the same time, it is, uh, it is healthy never to assume that you you reached the end <laughs> Cause, uh, because of the tricks of the mind the mind can make you believe that you are there and therefore you don't need to meditate anymore and that's tricky and that's why also again we need a teacher to challenge us every now and then right uh, you ask sorry just sitting meditation versus the practice of meditation yes well it's this it's exactly it's, is this it yeah so um, it can go by phases but I can imagine how even after you get to stabilize fully that state of self-knowledge, you would still be meditating. It's just that you practice meditation in a, in a stable way, in a constant way. I mean, you, you can be speaking to somebody and meditating at the same time, if that makes any sense, right? But you are not like, I don't know, are you doing... Your sanna, yes, you are still doing your sanna to hold that state. Because again, it's very easy to to lose it and to fall into a fantasy that you are there, but you aren't. Yeah. So always keep humble. Never assume that you reach the the highest point. I would say that's the that's a good attitude in general for for the practice. But let's say we do it. Let's say we carry on. We keep on uh, with the practice, and we get there. Let's let's talk about all, all these terms that I mentioned, yeah? So, getting to this center, this is self-knowledge. This is self-realization. It doesn't mean that you are merging with the divine yet, because there's a still a veil. And this is where the diagram I showed at the very, very beginning makes sense. Yeah. Let me just show it one more time. I'm talking about the diagram of the self. I think I put it away. Wait. No. Oh, here it is. So remember, even if you reach the self, there is a stale veil. You see this veil here? And the, between you and the unknown. 
So it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are one with the divine yet. Yeah. So Hale asks, how much isolation is important for the path, especially after Pratyahara? It's just a tricky question because, you see, we it, it used to be that to practice yoga, we, we would have to go into isolation. You would have to become a swami and a monk, right? Go into a cave or um, remove yourself from society. Decide that you're never going to have a family. Just pull away from the world and isolate. And now things have changed. Now it's about living in the world. The householder yoga is the one who has a family, a business, you work, you earn money, you have to pay bills. So how much is it possible and how much is it necessary and how much is it even need necessary? All right. So in a way, the one thing you realize at some point or another is that we are all alone in this world. And we all have a path to do, and there's nobody else who can do the path but us. Our path, our own path, our life, in our life. And that's lonely by itself. No matter how many people you have around you, and no matter if your life is walking beside somebody else, you know, having children, wife, husband, whatever. No matter what, a part of the path is lonely. The spiritual path has a very, very strong aspect of loneliness as well. At least for a, for a period of time. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. In, in India, for example, one would, you could have a, a family, you get married, you have children, you have a business, you grow it, you grow older, you leave the business to the family, and then you drop everything, you become a sadhu, you go into an ashram and dedicate your life to God. <laughs> you could do it like that. Like that. Uh, the, 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 the modern approach would be not to leave it for when you are 70, but right now, can I take some part for myself as well in the middle of my life? So, um, for example, I have two daughters, right? But I will wake up in the morning by myself. Generally, children need to sleep more than adults so I can get up earlier and take some time for my practice. And that's isolation. Yeah, that's by myself. And to me, I, I need it. I feel like I need that time for myself, for being within me. Talking about the cave, right? We mentioned the cave, going in within the cave. Because this self is in the cave, in the cave of the heart. Yeah, Hridaya Guhara. Yeah? However, if we just go into isolation first, we don't challenge ourselves. We are not confronted with the patterns that we have been accumulating. And, and also, it's a very self-centered way to operate. So, um, Dharma, Sangat, Guru. You want to get to Guru, you have to go through Sangat. And, and when you are in Sangat, then what you want to do is service. So... I would say it's a combination of things. So partly we need that isolation within, but also on the other hand, we also need the community with others. And those two ingredients are necessary in some way. Some periods of life, like you're saying, for a period of time, some periods of life may be really challenging to be in Sangat, and some periods of life may be very challenging to be isolated. I'm thinking when I... When my daughters were really young, just newborns, uh, it was really hard to have my sadhana. I would, I would just, um, and and look, I did it, I did it. I did, I was quite determined and quite committed. But now, looking back, I realized how much I was suffering physically because I would sleep very little hours, and then I would be doing my practice, but I would wake up very early. And uh, because I needed that time for isolation, but is it really feasible? For many people, it's not going to be. And me, because of my circumstances, I could do it. But I can imagine some people having to work many hours, taking care of the kids. Then you go to sleep. You know, the kids go to sleep, but you have to keep on 
doing things in the house or whatever, tidying up papers, and then you go to sleep, you sleep very little, and the kids are awake, you have to... And then you may have no time for isolation and your practice. So, yes, for periods of time, we may be impossible to keep an isolation time for isolation and for some periods of... And we have to take that. If I cannot be in isolation, can I assume that anybody around me is my Sangha? And then work from there. And then do yoga in that, in that interaction with others in the at work right can you do yoga when you're working whatever you are doing you can do yoga whatever you are doing you can at least breathe consciously at least right you can uh, be if i'm speaking to somebody if i'm in in a counter with people can i choose which heart which chakra am i speaking from can i relate to their chakras in whatever they are speaking can I, you know, apply the yoga to the moment? And then if I cannot be in isolation, at least I'm going to be doing yoga, right? And then there will be periods of time when things become softer and then we can take time for ourselves and we feel like we need it and it's healthy to go back to ourselves because at the end of the day, the path is lonely. It's a lonely path. So hopefully that answers. So... Throughout life, let's say we are keeping this balance of isolation, of Sangha, Dharma Sangha, and we eventually get to this self, self-knowledge, the center, and, and now we come into Samadhi. Now, when you wake up, when this Kundalini wakes up and he reaches the crown, when Shakti meets Shiva and there's this merger, there's this infinity, right? This is the higher unknown. This is what in this diagram was like the big unknown. Yeah, it, it goes all around. It's not, it's here, but it's it's all around. Yeah, so it, you see this veil here as well. So you're crossing the veil here, going into the merging with Shiva and the Shakti, and that's bringing you closer to the divine. But not yet. You are not merging fully yet. Yeah, you are just touching it, and so there are different. Excuse me, there are different states of samadhi, different levels of samadhi. Now, I'm not an expert on this. I've only read about this in books, and I don't know much about the different classifications or variations of that. But from my understanding, what I get is that as you are touching this divinity, then you're experiencing one, and you can be experiencing one with the... with um, on various levels, yeah? One with your breath, one with your consciousness, one with your soul, one with yourself, and then one with God, right? So there is like, there is a, a levels that you are increasingly going deeper. And so Samadhi would be, in a way, being the same, Sama, yeah? With this joining, yeah? In this moment of joining, of touching the one. However, there is still karma. We still have to come back to the world. The, we, we still have to reincarnate. You can... You can touch it and then you can come back. The energy, the kundalini may go back down and you may, you know, this may affect you and may transform your communication, your feelings, your mind for a minute, a day, a month, right? So one of these moments can touch you and have a sustained effect for a certain amount of time or you can hold that space. And if you can hold that state of samadhi, and the grace comes and descends, then the, the merging of Shiva and Shakti comes down into your heart and then you are settled into the heart and you are not only self-realized, but you, your, your karmas get burned and then you are freed from samsara, freed from the cycle, the circle of living and dying and reincarnating and all that. Now that is called liberation. No duality. Yes, John, exactly. So when you are touching in, in samadhi, you can go beyond duality, samadhi. And that's illumination. That's enlightenment. That's enlightenment. I said illumination. In Spanish, we say iluminación. So enlightenment. Liberation is when the this, this samsara, this, this samsara, sorry, the, the cycle of birth and rebirth is done for you samsara yeah so you are over that cycle of birth and rebirth 
So that's the, those, those, those terms, yeah? Samadhi uh, would be equi equivalent to enlightenment, that's seeing the light, seeing things clearly, and liberation. Now, liberation, the term for that is generally called moksha. Moksha means liberated. So uh, samadhi would be more like the enlightenment and moksha would be more like the liberation. Another term. Um, in the, in the, uh, okay. Nirvana from the Buddhist tradition would be equivalent to the liberation, to the moksha. It's just that we, it's a different word because it comes from the Buddhists. I mentioned the other day, nirvana comes from nir, which is, means no, va, meaning winds, and it would refer to kind of like the winds of, of suffering and desire, which are these two aspects which Buddha talks a lot about. When you read the Four Noble Truths, you, you will come upon these concepts. And by getting over this, you are, the, 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 the veil is revealed, yeah? And you see the light and your ignorance departs. So ignorance goes away, your, your karmas go away, and you liberate yourself. That's nirvana. So not nirvana would equi be equivalent to this liberation. Yeah? Now, there's, there is another term, which uh, it's a little bit abstract. I'm not sure 100% on this. There's a term called kaivalya, which is kind of also, it's a union with the divine. It's kind of, Sorry, uh, it's a, it's a, um, not union, it's a liberation in, in a way. You're free from karmas and your soul is free, let's say, from the karmas that were being accumulated to, to that particular soul over lives and lives. But it's not like fully in union with the divine. That's the way I underst understand this particular term, kaivalya. But again, I'm not 100% sure. If somebody knows, maybe you can mention it, write it in the chat or in the comments of the video so that we can know for sure. More terms which are similar. Shunya. The term shunya means that you are zero. So the ego is not in front anymore and you are totally receptive, totally open in a listening space. That's a very meditative state. So that's pure meditation. And you are listening, you are hearing, you hear the self and you hear um, existence, yeah? So it is very open, very receptive, meditative state, no ego in the middle, and zero, yeah? Total openness, let's say. Shunya. Another term which is uh, common in the texts you can find is Simran. Simran. Simran is linked to a word in Sanskrit meaning uh, memory. And it, Simran basically means like remembrance, which means that you remember the name of God in every breath, but it's also like you remember your own essence, you remember who you are, meaning the self, so the self-realization thing, yeah? So in Simran, you are in a state of remembrance of the divine and remembrance of your true nature, of your satnam. That's Simran, a state. In, and you can be hearing the mantra in the breath, like in a japa jap. A japa jap means that the mantra is sounding in your head even without you trying it. It's kind of like when you hear a song and then it gets stuck in your head, uh, similar but with mantras. So the mantra is playing in the background and you're just enjoying that divine music. So that would be playing in the background, that's a japa jap. And Simran is that remembrance, constant rem remembrance of the divine name and vibrating. What else? Well, there is one, there is one term we, we mentioned as well, Turiya. I, I didn't, I didn't uh, mention in the, in the summary, yeah? You will remember one of the videos of this course when we talked about uh, Jagrat being like, I, I, put it, I put it in relationship to this diagram. Here it is, Chakrat, and then Swapana, and then Sushupti, and then Turiya. And I mentioned how interesting that is like one, two, three, four, rather than one, two, three, four, but we have to understand Turiya is like, is like beyond, beyond the other three, is like these three to another level. So Hel says, I've read about Kavalia as ultimate aloneness. Yes, okay, I mean, Imagine if it, it, it if the way I've seen it described, yeah, 
like it's you are liberated, your, your soul is free from karmas and free from any attachment, material, emotional and spiritual. So the three grantees have been broken. I didn't mention that as well, but it, it would be worth... If you've seen my channel, there's a number of videos on the grantees. So you've, you've crossed the three grantees, the three knots, right? You open the three locks, go through the three knots, and then the three caves are open, and then, and then you are liberated, but there is no union with the divine, then that has to be loneliness for sure. It has to be very, very lonely in a way. But I guess there is bliss as well. Satchitananda, right? So it's lonely, but it's blissful, and nothing really happens. There is no events anymore. It's just a pure, sustained state, stable state, yeah. It's, it's so difficult to imagine all these things, all these terms, right? And um, I mean, I am not there, so I, what can I say? I don't know how it is, right? <laughs> Uh, I can only say what I read and what I hear and what I what makes sense to me from my understanding and with the numbers. But um, any anyone who gets there, when they try to speak about it, they just speak in riddles, they speak in poems, or maybe they just don't speak. Wasn't there a an Indian? Um, was it Ramakrishna or Krishna Murti? Or I cannot remember exactly who it was. But they, somebody would would ask him. A student was like, but Master. How is Samadhi? And he would say, Samadhi is... And he would go into Samadhi. <laughs> I would just not reply. I would just be there. <laughs> and then he would come back. Okay? <laughs> is it clear? <laughs> so it's like, uh, if you are there, how can you speak about that, right? So um, this is all we can do to try to understand this really abstract... Uh, I don't know if it's even abstract, but it's subtle. Let's say subtle, not abstract, but these very subtle states. And Turiya would be the, the fourth state of consciousness, beyond sleeping, beyond awake. Uh, I mentioned that that you know you can be you can wake up in dreams. So there is this kind of mixture between dreams and awake. And you can be dreamy when you're awake. So there's this mixture. But uh Turiya is beyond these three basic states. And Sometimes they describe it like you are both asleep and awake at the same time. Because you are fully awake. Remember, Buddha, the word name Buddha means the awakened one. And, and that would mean that um, buddhi, you remember the fourth function of the mind? Buddhi would be fully awake. Yeah, You are full in your wisdom, in your discernment. All the choices come from here, from this sp space no longer affected by your likes and your dislikes from the ego and from the hunker. So you are awakened, yeah? So in Turiya, you are in fully in this awakened state, but at the same time, it's also the same as being asleep because there is no waves. There is no fluctuations anymore. So imagine, so hell, you're not only alone, but nothing is happening. No thought waves anymore. No fluctuations of the mind. No big emotions coming and going and roller coasters and pure, stable awareness and consciousness. It's so impossible to imagine. So hard. How can we just even comprehend what it means? Just that state. And yet, as long as we are not there, we suffer, right? So let us let us move in that direction. John says, sitting in a Manama Maharshi's silence. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And that's what I that's the, that's the thing about, I like about about Ramana Maharshi. Can, can could we just sit in his presence, right, and just be in silence and let all these thoughts come down and just being the bliss. That is, I mean, just not thinking negative thoughts, that's already such a relief. Can you imagine, no? If we can just steal the surface of the lake, then it's like um, the metaphor I gave the other day, you know, the, the surface of the lake is steel, then you can see yourself reflected in the surface of the water, and you can see the depth of the pool, yeah? You can see the, the depth of the self. So 
when somebody goes there, then of course you are in silence. Shunya, that, that the word Shunya meaning zero, zero also implies a silence. So that's a state of Shunya as well. There is no more to say. Uh, having reached the silence, I think we covered everything, didn't we? I believe so. Samadhi, Moksha, Nirvana, Kaivalya, Turiya, Shunya, Simran, Enlightenment, Realization, Liberation. Yeah, all the terms, isn't it? And um, there was one thing I mentioned when we were doing this diagram. I mentioned this is not just how the universe was created, but this is a map. Remember I mentioned this is a map for meditation so that when you are closing your eyes, you're going upwards. So this is it, yeah? When we are doing Pratyahara Dharana Dhyana Samadhi, as above, so below. So as you're going down below into your heart, then you're also going up towards the one, up towards the source. So you're doing both at the same time. It's like when we are seeing the different diagrams for the, the when we are talking about the self, the different aspects of the self, that's when we are finding this. There is the inner real self, and then there's the higher self, and it's just as above, so below. Both are you can connect to both at the same time. Yeah. Hope uh, to me it makes sense. I don't know if I, I managed to convey it, this sense or not. But to me, that this is a good way to, to connect all the elements and to understand, look, this is where we are, this is what's causing suffering, this is what's happening in your mind, this is how you're creating karma, this is what you can do to stop it, this is the path, and where do you get through this path? These are the different states that you can get. So, there's nothing else but silence at this point, or maybe a poem, <laughs> like we read on Thursday. Beautiful points from Rumi. If you didn't check that session, it was really, really nice. The, the poem from Rumi and exploring when the soul lies in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Yeah, that sentence is like, you just want to be in silence. So let the soul go back to that grass, green grass, this meadow beyond the right and the wrong. And uh, let's rest there. And like... Rumi was saying in that uh, poem, don't go back to sleep. Yeah, Stay in Turiya. Stay awake. Stay connected. Thank you, everyone. It was lovely. We still have a few more videos for this mind course, but for today, it is quite enough. Thank you for being here and uh, have a beautiful meditation. And until next time, Satnam. <laughs>